Good evening. Good evening. Good evening, everyone. I know that we still have some people coming in, but I am going to get try and get us started so that way we can get to our speaker. I am Brooke Clement, director of the Gerald R. Ford Presidential Library and Museum which is part of the National Archives and Records Administration. I am so glad to welcome you here tonight, which is our final program of 2024. Uh, thank you for your commitment to the Library and Museum. As always, I want to make sure I thank the Gerald R. Ford Presidential Foundation for its continued support. This year, we have had so many programs, so many exhibits. It has been a fantastic year, and we could not have done it without all of you. Yes. Absolutely. All right. So before we begin, just can I ask that you uh, ensure that your cell phones are turned off or placed on silent? One note, uh, the holiday train, uh, the Gerald R. Ford Presidential Express, is going to be on display in the lobby starting on December 6th. We do have a couple of new University of Michigan related items we're adding to the train this year. Burton Memorial Clock Tower and the Big House. So go blue <laughs> and come and <laughs> come visit. Uh, with that, let me now turn it over to Gleaves Whitney to introduce tonight's speaker. Come on, that was a really weak go blue. <laughs> okay, uh, we could say go green too if that's what it takes to get you to say go blue. No, so happy to, uh, to see so many people here. Of course, this is always special when we have H.W. Brands back. I have the pleasure of introducing him, but first, just want to uh, mention that we have some very distinguished people in the audience. We have a member of the Ford family, uh, Greg Ford. We're so pleased, Greg, that you came out this evening. Thank you. We also have a trustee, uh, David Hooker, back there. Thank you so much for your service, David. And of course, sitting next to him is uh, his dad, Bob Hooker, who was on the board and taught David everything he knows. <laughs> no, so, uh, so great to see you, all these friends of Ford. You know, you friends of Ford are the ones who make these programs possible. I'll say something about that uh, in the wrap at the end of the evening. But right now, I want to uh, introduce our distinguished speaker. Bill Brands has been coming back to Grand Rapids a long time. H.W. Brands has you know, just been a prolific author and researcher, great teacher, somebody, anybody watches the History Channel, it's people like Bill Brands that keep it from being called the Hitler Channel because he uh, says so much about American history in such insightful ways. And you know, if 2 a.m. and you can't sleep, you turn on the History Channel, you'll probably, you'll probably see Bill, you know? Uh, he's helped me go back to sleep many a night. <laughs> no, Bill is always, always uh, insightful. And I think that, that you will find tonight particularly interesting. Now, Bill and I always kind of have a little negotiation about what he's going to speak about. Because we're going through the 50th anniversary of the Ford right now. All these great 50th anniversaries that, you know, when Ford, you know, uh, became president, the swearing in on August 9th, the pardon, on September 8th, and there are many other key moments in the Ford presidency, moments that audiences like you are resonating with. I mean, we have noticed the uptick in attendance here. You remember those early, I said, get more people to fill these seats, you have delivered. And it's because President Ford and Mrs. Ford, both of them, speak to something that's profoundly needed today. Well, Bill addresses this, and so when we uh, were negotiating, I said, Bill, what do you want to talk about? He said, Gleaves, you know me. I don't know what I'm going to talk about until I get on the stage. And so I think we narrowed it down, though, as today uh, we spent a little time together. And I think what he's going to talk about are three things. I think he's going to talk about his latest book, America First. Because ladies and gentlemen, this book, even though it takes place in the 30s and the 40s, the setting of the book seems that the themes of the book could have been written about today. The election on Tuesday turned on how you resolve the question of what America's relationship with the world should be. So I think Bill's gonna talk about his book, 
I think Bill's also going to talk a little bit about President Ford because President Ford is in the midst of the same question. Remember, he comes into office when basically the United States is mopping up in a major war, our first major defeat for America. And it was a tough time. And I think a lot of us in this room remember that period and kind of an America first debate crept in again. You know, should, if, if, if this is what America's leadership in the world looks like, uh, I think we'll take a powder. <laughs> we can do without it. And then the third thing that Bill, I think, is going to touch on, because he is the preeminent presidential historian in our country, I think he's going to talk about the election a little bit, to put it in, not to give it a partisan flavor, but to put it in the historical perspective that will help us all understand better what's going on right now as we try to interpret these challenging times. So with that, Bill Brands, please come on up. Thank you, please, for that introduction and that setup, but I think there's a slight misunderstanding. <laughs> the, what I think you just said, I was going to speak on this and that and that. I understood it as this or that or that. Hmm. Okay, well. Oh, and I have to comment as well. I think you sort of channeled my mother, your comment about watching these, watching these things at 2 o'clock in the morning. Because uh, my mom used to say that she had tried to read each of my books. <laughs> and she said she finished one of them. I would say, I don't think she did, but I shouldn't gainsay my mother. But what she would say is, I have your latest book on my bedstand. And I read it before going to sleep, and it works perfectly. <laughs> so apparently, my appearances on the History Channel do the same thing with Glees. <laughs> but one of, the, one of the great things about doing a, a documentary on history is that the documentaries have a really long shelf life. Because if you're talking about events that are already 200 years old, you know, what's another five or 10 years? And so I will hear from people who say, hey, I saw you on TV last night. I said, yeah, I get you. You're one of those insomniacs, too. Huh? OK. And you know, I really liked what you said, but, but you look so much younger <laughs> on there. And I said, well, I was. That was you know, 20 years ago. Time passes. Yes, time does pass. And I'm going to begin. I am going to touch on the, the topics that Cleves mentioned. But first, I want to probe your memories. I need to know a little bit about my audience. Any, I tell this to my, my students, especially my graduate students who are beginning writers. But any writer or speaker, anybody who tries to communicate, needs to have some idea about the people that he is speaking to. And so I need to know just a little bit about what you know and maybe what you don't know. I teach at the University of Texas. And this semester, I have mostly first and second year students. So these are students who are 18 and 19 years old. And these are students who were born well into this century. These are students for whom, well, Gerald Ford or Ronald Reagan might as well be Abraham Lincoln. <laughs> you know, so, but anyway, so I'm going to ask some questions. And I don't mean to. Uh, if anybody feels that I'm trying to uh, get you to reveal your age or anything like that, you don't have to participate. But there are moments in history that sort of uh, that signal where we are all together at one time. For example, and maybe some of, is there anybody in the room who remembers where you were and what you were doing when Franklin Roosevelt died? Anybody? OK. Hillary? Yeah. OK. Because my mom, this is one of the formative moments in my mother's life. She remembers that she was walking home with some friends from getting some ice cream. And she heard the news that the president had died. And it was a really big deal for her because she, uh, he, Franklin Roosevelt, was the 
only president my mother had known at that time. He was president for 12 years, and she was in college. So he was elected the first time when she was six years old or something like that. Okay. How many of you remember where you were and what you were doing uh, when you heard that John Kennedy had been shot in 1963? Okay. So now I've got an idea, and I, I certainly do. I was in fifth grade. How many remember where you were and what you were doing when you heard the news about the 9-11 attack on the World Trade Center? OK, all right. All right. Um, how many of you remember where you were and what you were doing when you heard that Gerald Ford had become president? Well, OK, that's more than I would have guessed. This is Grand Rapids, after all. <laughs> but, but I remember that as well. And I, I mean, I knew that, you know, Gerald Ford was vice president of the United States and all this stuff, but I grew up in Oregon, and I had no particular connection to Gerald Ford, um, except that I didn't remember it as Gerald Ford becoming president. What I took note of was the fact that Richard Nixon had resigned, and the corollary of that, of course, was that Gerald Ford became president. And one of the reasons that I remember this is it occurred two days after my 21st birthday. And I was in college at the time. I was about to become a senior in college. And I remember following the Watergate story for during, from early 73 when it first surfaces, and then all through that. And I remember thinking, well, of course, it was a little bit before this that the Supreme Court renders its decision in the case of, does uh, Nixon have to turn over the tapes? And once the tapes are turned over, then it's pretty clear that the end is in sight. And, and then I, in fact, my family was at the Oregon coast. And on that day, I had taken my grandparents, my maternal grandparents, for a drive along the coast. And they were both getting up in age. And my grandfather was beginning to sort of slip into dementia, but he still liked a car ride. And so we went for a drive along the coast and spent the whole day and I remember getting back to the, the house that we'd rented for the week and hearing, in fact, I, it was just about when the news was turned on and Richard Nixon had resigned and the business of him in the, the helicopter, you know, getting on, giving the victory sign and all that. And, and then, and I knew enough about Gerald Ford to know that he seemed like a good solid guy. And as far as I knew, he was chosen well, in part because he would be easy to confirm, and nobody wanted a controversy over that. But he seemed to have a good record as a leader in Congress, and somebody who could be, who could be relied upon to do the right thing. And so all seemed good, and, and then you know, the question was, well, what's going to become of Richard Nixon? And so we're waiting to see the rest of this story. And then, of course, I don't have to tell you what happened a month later when Gerald Ford pardoned Richard Nixon. And I will tell you that my response was, well, probably what you would guess of the response of a college kid. I was going to college in California. And you know, I think, oh my god. I thought, Jerry Ford, you know, what are you doing? And I think, OK, well, obviously, this deal was cooked. The fix was in from the beginning. And I was really disappointed. I thought, OK, we're never going to get to the bottom of this Watergate story. And this is a huge opportunity lost. And you'll be aware, I mean, I, I'm sure you're aware, that there was a great deal of disappointment and anger over this decision at the time. And, and um, you know, I thought, and, you know, he gave his talk about why it had to be done and, and what it was good for and, and how the nation needed to heal and to move on, and this is, was the way of doing it. And I got to say, it took me a while to kind of come around to the idea that, well, maybe, maybe he did the right thing here. Um, and interestingly, the fact that it had this blowback effect on his career, I think most people who study 
presidential politics, would conclude that his decision to pardon Richard Nixon was a principal reason that he lost the election of 1976, and he didn't have a presidential term in his own right. And paradoxically, that effect sort of made me think that, well, maybe he was sincere in doing this. Because if he had done it for his own personal benefit, I pardon you, you make me president, well, it didn't work. You know, he sort of screwed it up. And so that would have been kind of a bad deal. And then the fact that he actually had done it and it, it cost him his, the rest of his political career, well, it kind of made me think that, all right, maybe he really was sincere about it. Now, hold that thought, because I'm going to come back to that a little bit later, because I've got actually two other topics that <laughs> Gleaves has assigned me. But I will say this, that Gerald Ford became president under about the most inauspicious circumstances in the history of the presidency. Maybe Andrew Johnson following the assassination of Abraham Lincoln, maybe he had it worse. Yeah, he did have it worse. The country was just ending a civil war and didn't know what to do with Reconstruction and all that. But in the case of Gerald Ford, he was having to deal with, well, first of all, the fallout from Watergate. And, and what it entailed for a fundamental loss of confidence in government. And I think, actually, a couple of years ago, I was talking about this when, sort of in my first of the talks on the four years in the presidency. But in American history, from the 1940s through the 1960s, or certainly into the 1960s, Americans' perception of government was very different than what it has been for the last 40 or 50 years. People thought the government actually could do the right thing, and that it probably would do the right thing. And in fact, this idea that government can do the right thing is at the basis of, well, what we can sort of generically call the, the liberal program of if there's a social problem, if there's a problem in society, poverty, pollution, healthcare, whatever it could be, look to government, and government can probably solve it. Government has the resources. Government has the organizational capacity to do it. And so this was what underlay the great society, the civil rights reforms of the 1960s. And this confidence in government was what made modern liberal America. Because if you start, if you go back further to Franklin Roosevelt and the New Deal, and so people got the idea that government can actually do something worthwhile. People associated the New Deal with improving their lives during the Great Depression. Then along comes World War II, and the government of the United States leads the United States and the democracies of the world to victory. Now that's really doing something right. So at the end of World War II, the stock of American government in public perceptions was really high. And it stayed high through the 1950s. The 1950s were a prosperous time and into the 1960s. The 1960s dented it a little bit because of the riots and the controversy over civil rights and various other things. But this confidence in government took two real hammer blows it, at the end of the 60s and the, into the 1970s. And one was the war in Vietnam, and the other one was Watergate. And so when I'm speaking, I think, for more than just myself, when I said that I was so disappointed when Jerry Ford pardoned Richard Nixon because, okay, here was the guy who was going to set things right after Watergate, and then he just sort of lets Nixon go. And so, as I said, I eventually came around to the point of view that it was probably the right thing to do with a caveat that I'm still going to come back to that we'll get to. Um, but anyway, from the middle of the 1970s until today, as exemplified by the election that took place just two days ago, 
Americans do not think much of our government. And I mean, Donald Trump had been campaigning against the government from, from 2015 and again this time around. And he won. He won by a substantial margin. So American voters are not impressed with our government. And this in decided contrast to the, the attitude, the feeling of Americans toward their government from the 1930s into the early 1970s. OK. Now, what did Ford have to deal with? He had to deal with inflation. He had to deal with Watergate. He had to deal with, well, the biggest question he had to deal with, and this was, I always say, the, the most profound question he had to deal with was, what is America's role in the world? Because Gerald Ford became president as it was becoming clear that the United States had lost the war in Vietnam. The end hadn't quite come. That would come in the spring of 1975. The Paris Peace Accords had pulled American troops out and the United States was supposed to continue to guarantee the security of South Vietnam, but that wasn't going to happen because Americans had decided the Vietnam War has been going on too long. And so when the North Vietnamese broke the, the truce deal and invaded South Vietnam in the spring of 75, there was no political will in the United States to go back in and, and fight the war again. So Americans are asking, what is the role of the United States in the world? Which brings me to the topic of my book, which is about, well, Americans grappling with this very question at a time when Gerald Ford was a young man. And he had to confront this question. And the question is, what is America's role in the world? Should the United States be a leader of the world? Should it be the leader of the world? And I write about it in the context of the decision whether the United States should enter World War II. Except when the debate was going on, World War II was not yet World War II. There was a war in Europe that began in September of 1939. There was a separate war that was going on in Asia. Japan had invaded China, actually much earlier than that. And there were these two separate wars. And Americans were asking themselves, is it our responsibility as Americans to get involved in these wars? And when these wars began, the overwhelming view of Americans was, no, we should not, if you'll pardon the, the strong language, hell no, we should not, because we tried this once before. We went to Europe during what then was called the World War. It wouldn't be called World War I until there was a second one. So the World War, we went to Europe, Hundreds of thousands of Americans went to Europe during the First World War, and they fought, and the American side won on the battlefield. But the victory was spoiled at the peace conference by the greed of America's allies, the British and the French, and their unwillingness to cut any slack for Germany and to impose on Germany an unpayable debt basically building up resentments in Germany that were going to burst out sooner or later. And Americans, well, by the time the peace conference ended, Americans were beginning to think this was really a bad idea to go in there. Within a few years, when it became very clear that this peace deal was no peace deal at all, but a guarantor of future conflict, Americans almost to a person said, that was a really bad idea. We will not do it again. And when things got worse during the 1930s, when America was mired in depression, when the world was mired in depression, and when alarming new movements arose in Europe, fascism in Italy, Nazism in Germany, Francoism in Spain, and Americans began to see, uh-oh, there's probably another war coming. And Americans, again, almost to a person said, these are not our conflicts. These are not our problems. To the point where Congress passed legislation, a series of laws in the 1930s that said, if a war breaks out in a foreign country, we're not going to get involved. Basically, mandating that the president not do anything that would get the United States involved. Because Americans remembered how the United States got into World War I that Woodrow Wilson took step 
after step, after step, getting a little bit closer to war, a little bit closer to war, until the Germans concluded, well, the Americans are effectively at war, so we might as well start sinking their ships. And Americans overwhelmingly said, we're not going to do that again. And they cited American history. George Washington, the historically minded of them, said, warned us in his farewell address against getting involved in the affairs of Europe. He said, stick with America's affairs. Do not become attached to foreign nations. We've got enough to do minding our own business. And this had been America's policy for the nearly century and a half since George Washington. And there was that one exception during World War I, but Americans quickly said, oh, that was a mistake. We won't do it again. So Americans in the mid-1930s were what I'll use the term because it's so commonly used, but you should be aware that people, the term is isolationism and isolationist. You should be aware that people who were called isolationists didn't call themselves isolationists because it suggests that you ignore what happens in the world. It suggests that you are trying to isolate America. No, in fact, what the isolationists wanted was we just don't want to deliberately, egregiously, stick ourselves in other people's problems. We want to trade with the world. We want to be able to travel in the world. But we don't necessarily think that the defense of France is America's problem, or the defense of Britain is America's problem. Let the French deal with it. Let the British deal with it. And it's important to note, again, I can't stress it too much, this was the thinking of 95% of Americans in the 1930s, and it seemed the most obvious thing in the world. Why would we want to do that? So this is the background for my story. The, my title of my book is America First. That's the label of the most prominent anti-war group of the period before World War II. And the subtitle is Roosevelt versus Lindbergh in the Shadow of War. And the shadow of war well, the war that's the shadow of is the war that has broken out in Europe. So my story unfolds between September 1939 and December 1941, so this two-year and four-month period, when really for the first time in American history, there is this trenchant debate over what is America's role in the world? Now, narrowly speaking, the debate was over, do we send military aid to Britain and France? Or do we modify the neutrality legislation so that belligerents can purchase weapons from the United States? Or do we allow American nationals to sail on ships of countries at war. These were, these were provisions of the neutrality legislation. You, know, you can't do that, because that's how the United States got into World War I. And the protagonist of my story, I can't help it. When I write history, I write history focusing on individuals. I can't write broad sort of social history. I can't write history unless I can find people to focus on, unless I can hear the people talking, unless I can convey their messages through their words. And the protagonists I choose are Franklin Roosevelt. He's an obvious character. He is president of the United States. Charles Lindbergh is a less likely individual because he wasn't an elected official. He held no, well, he was um, a colonel in the Air Force Air Corps Reserve, so he's that. But he became the most, promise, the most prominent spokesman for the anti-war position. And so I recount the debate. And in doing so, in doing so, I have to, I have to somehow get my readers, I have to get you, since you're my audience today, to forget what you know about how this turned out, okay? And the reason I have to do this is, well, because you know how it turned out, because you know that the United States did get involved in World War II, and because you know that World War II turned out well for the United States, and it 
led to this era of American leadership in the world. And most Americans came to think that's a pretty good idea. They kind of liked the idea of the United States as number one. I'll tell you, because I, I have to take you back. If somebody had said in 1935, do you think the United States must be number one in the world? They would have said, what in the world are you talking about? Number one, what does that mean? And if it means what I think you mean, no. We don't want that at all. Because it means that we're going to be responsible for the crazy things that other people do. We have trouble enough minding our own business. So anyway, what I have to get you to do is forget that you know that that's how it turned out. Because at the time, the Lindbergh position, we don't want that leadership role. We want what George Washington wanted for us. Mind our own business, defend our own shores. That's what most Americans wanted. But of course, that's not the way it happened, and most Americans became happy with the way things turned out. Oh, and, and oh, and I should add that this position of American leadership is one that has really, it took hold. It took hold really as soon as Americans, well, Hillary, no, wait, I didn't ask this question. Uh, Hillary, do you remember where you were when you heard of the attack on Pearl Harbor? Sure. Okay, all right. Well, needless to say, everybody of that age, they knew that. And that was the moment, by the way, when the debate ended. The debate ended not because Franklin Roosevelt, who was in favor of intervention, sort of won on points. He didn't prove to be the better debater. He won because the Japanese attacked the United States. And Japan was an ally of Germany. And that meant that the United States was at war regardless of what, where the debate went. So anyway, from that point until today, no, not until today, until two days ago, until two days ago, this idea that the United States should be the leader of the world had been just accepted wisdom to the point where it's hard to get anybody to take Charles Lindbergh and his argument seriously. They are labeled, he's labeled an isolationist. And what is an isolationist? An isolationist, well, the editorial cartoon is, the isolationist is that ostrich with its head stuck in the sand. And the world is going to hell all around, and the ostrich is just ignoring all that. That's, well, that's, that's why the isolationists didn't call themselves isolationists. They called themselves non-interventionists. They called themselves anti-war. They called themselves America first. America's first obligation is to America. And, but because things turned out the way they did, because the United States, I'm going to say, because the United States won World War II, but I have to point out that that's an exaggeration that flatters the United States. Most of, well, two-thirds of the casualties inflicted on the army of Germany were not inflicted by the American army. They were inflicted by the Soviets. Okay? So the Soviet Union thought, we won World War II, which also complicates this story. And I have to, I will admit, I like complicating things. I like things complicated. Um, but when Americans think we won the war, and they think, well, somebody like Charles Lindbergh was wrong in saying, you know, we shouldn't go to war. It's not in America's interest. One of the things that he said was, you know, if we go to war, Franklin Roosevelt was saying, we have to go to war to defend democracy. And Lindbergh said, wait a minute, wait a minute. Who are we going to go to war with? We're going to go to war with Britain. Is Britain a democracy? Well, kind of in Britain. But what about in India? What about in the rest of the British Empire? We're going to go to war. If we go to war, it will be to defend British imperialism. Is that what you want? Well, that's not what you're hearing from Franklin Roosevelt. But that's what it will be about. And then, and then in the summer of 1941, this is six months before Pearl Harbor, Germany attacks the Soviet Union. And now the United States begins, begins sending aid to the Soviet Union. And Lindbergh said, a war for democracy? Wait a minute. We're fighting on the side of the communists. And he went on to say, you know, if we go back into Europe, we'll never get out. We went in once and got out, but if we go in a second time, we will be there forever. 
And, well, uh, where are we today? So this is, this is kind of my point. But there was one moment, there was one moment during this long period from December 6, December 7, 1941, to two days ago, where it seemed that the United States might no longer feel obliged to be the leader of the world. The United States might no longer feel that it's in America's best interest to say that the frontiers of democracy are wherever democracy or aggression occurs. And that was when Jerry Ford was president. Because you may remember this, but in the wake of Vietnam, a lot of people said, you know, this, how did we get into Vietnam? Well, we got into Vietnam kind of by the same reasoning that we got into Korea. And it was based on the idea, and this was the argument that Franklin Roosevelt was making in promoting the idea of intervention. The United States must be the leader of the world. That there is this conflict between democracy and autocracy. The world is divided into these two camps, and we have to strengthen the camp of democracy. So wherever aggression occurs, we have to be prepared to combat it. And that led to the war in Korea, which, if you will recall some of you perhaps, turned out unsatisfactorily for the United States. After victory in World War I, Korea was this ugly tie. A lot of Americans died in Korea, and nothing was different than before the war. And then comes Vietnam, and Vietnam wasn't just a tie, Vietnam was a defeat. And Americans began to say, and in fact, Jimmy Carter did say, we ought to rethink this, you know? Because if being the leader of the world means that we send hundreds of thousands of American troops thousands of miles from home and lose tens of thousands of them in what ultimately turned out to be a failed effort to defeat a nationalist uprising, well, Maybe that's not the right policy. You may remember that one of the big fights that Jerry Ford had as president was with the conservative wing of his own party, of the Republicans, because he was vice president to Richard Nixon, and Richard Nixon was the author of detente. Remember detente? Detente was the idea that the United States could live with Soviet communism. Until then, the belief had been Either democracy or communism was going to win. They couldn't coexist. But detente was all about peaceful coexistence. By the way, I'll add this. When Germany was on the brink of apparently, well, of defeating, when it did defeat France in 1940, this is back to the earlier debate, he said that the United States might have to learn to live with dictators. And Franklin Roosevelt and Roosevelt's ally said, what an inane thing to say, what a malicious thing to say, to learn to live with dictators? Well, that's exactly what Richard Nixon said with detente. And among Republican conservatives, and there were some hawkish Democratic conservatives as well, he said detente is a terrible idea. We need to sort of get back on the ball and just fight the next Vietnam War better instead of avoiding the next Vietnam War. And this became a big issue. And ultimately, the hawkish side won when Richard Nixon, I'm sorry, when Ronald Reagan became president. So there was that window in the middle where Americans began to think, wait a minute, maybe this decision that we made in the early 1940s to abjure isolationism and embrace interventionism and world leadership, maybe we ought to rethink that. And one of, the reasons, I mean, one of the reasons that Jerry Ford didn't win in 76 was that he had parted in Richard Nixon. Another reason he didn't win that it was that he was challenged from the right in his own party by Ronald Reagan, saying this detente stuff, you're too soft on communism. OK, now I'm referring to events of two days ago. The election of 2024 was unusual, essentially it was unique, in the following sense. 
it was the first time since 1940 when Franklin Roosevelt was running for a third term, a historic, a precedent-setting third term, on the platform of more aid to the countries at war, on the platform of America needs to be the leader of the world. And Charles Lindbergh was not his opponent, but he was the most visible critic of Roosevelt during this period. And so Americans had this choice. Do you think... America needs to be number one and needs to defend democracy everywhere around the world? Or are you willing to believe that North America, and maybe South America too, is a big enough sphere for the United States? And we should focus our energies on making American society, American life, the American economy better here instead of squandering our energies and resources on people in countries far away. That was a fundamental question in 1940. Well, for the first time since 1940, in 2024, Americans had a choice. Because between 1940 and 2024, essentially every candidate, every nominee of both parties took the position that the United States is and must remain the leader of the world. Now, I'm going to pause for a moment and, and ask you a question. It's a question I pose to my students. So suppose we were having a presidential election. And there were two candidates, and you were kind of undecided between the two candidates. So in your thinking, the two candidates are basically the same, except for one point on one issue. Candidate A says, the United States is the greatest country in the world. The United States should adopt a foreign policy commensurate with that greatness. Elect me, and the United States will be the leader of the world. The United States is number one and must remain number one. That's candidate A. Okay? Candidate B says, number one? Nah, that's not that big a deal. We don't need to be number one. We don't have to be the greatest country in the world in the way you're talking about. It. We can be great by having the best economy, the best health care, the best schools, the best stuff at home. But we don't have to show our greatness by sending our armies around the world. If we focus on America, I don't really care if the world says, ah, you're number two, or you're number four, or number five. Okay? So candidate A says, we're number one. Candidate B says, you know, uh, four or five, that'd be fine. If that's all you know about the two candidates, who do you think is going to win the election? Well. Historically, it's been the person who says, we're going to be number one, you know, because America's great, and we'll do that if you like me. And essentially, well, so Americans, they didn't have that choice, because everybody wanted to say America is going to be, we're going to continue America's leadership, until, until Donald Trump came along. And Donald Trump is the first presidential candidate to propose seriously a rethinking of this. Now, when he was running in 2016, he didn't, didn't lead with this, but he had been making remarks to this effect. But this time around, as have, having been president, having challenged the basis, for example, of NATO and of America's commitments to the world, and having said, you know, that idea of a free trade, by, I should point out, that free trade was one of the underpinnings of this whole scheme of America leading the world, because it would lead the world by example, and the world would be knitted together economically so it wouldn't go to war militarily. And Donald Trump was the first president to openly campaign on, let's have tariffs. Let's engage in an open tariff war with other countries, like China. And we will beat them. And we will make all our stuff ourselves. We will retreat into this economic zone of our own. And America will be great in that regard. Now, Kamala Harris, Vice President Harris, she essentially adopted the position of Joe Biden, President Biden. And the hallmark of that position is, and still is, at least until now, American aid to Ukraine in Ukraine's war against Russia. Now, Charles Lindbergh would have said, and the anti-interventionists would have said, if the United States gets involved in this European war, in 1939, 1940, there's no end to it. And we will be fighting wars in Europe forever and ever. 
And he would have said, yeah, it'll probably come out like this aid to Ukraine. And Franklin Roosevelt said, no, 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 that sort of thing's not going to happen. But if Lindbergh were around today, he said, well, that's exactly what this policy leads to. And Donald Trump has said, this is not a good policy for the United States. And the striking thing about the election of 2024 was, as I say, the two candidates had these strikingly different views about what America's position in the world ought to be. And, of course, Donald Trump won. Now, a question that's going to follow this is, you, state, you say stuff, candidates say stuff during campaigns. And then what do they do after they become president? So what's the follow through? I can guarantee you, though, I mean, I know this because I was reading the newspapers today, that leaders of other NATO countries, they're saying, OK, what in the world does this mean? Does it mean the United States pulling out of NATO? I will tell you because spokesman for the Russian government has said, we won. You know, this is, this is going to be a really change in things. And, and so the United States is not going to be trying to impose its liberal Western order on Europe. And the United States is going to allow the creation of these zones in the world. And Russia will have its zone. And America will, we're not going to bother America in their zone in the Americas. So it's unclear. It's unclear to what extent this question, what's America's role in the world, guided voters when they went to the polls on Tuesday and in the early voting in the days before. I'm, I'd be surprised if there were very many voters who said, that's the number one issue for me. However, however, it did contribute to worldviews. And for those people who voted for Donald Trump, and I suspect there's some of you in the room who did, um, I, you can ask yourself, so how much of your support for Donald Trump was based on your agreement with his position that Ukraine's war against Russia is not America's war? And now, I should add here, I mean, that's what Charles Lindbergh would have said. Charles Lindbergh also would have said that Israel's war against Iran and Hamas, that's not America's war either. And so, to expect consistency among politicians and candidates is a bit too much, perhaps. Um, but, but anyway, I'm going to stop there and see if you have any questions. But I touched all three, right? OK, all right. So And I invite objections, rebuttals, questions, whatever it might be. And it can be about. History it can be about Charles Lindbergh, it can be about Jerry Ford, it can be about the recent election and what's going to happen after that. Questions? Yes? Uh, aside from Gerald Ford himself, Arthur H. Vandenberg was perhaps the most notable statesman to come out of Grand Rapids. I wonder if he makes it into your book because he was quite an isolationist uh, before the war and then flipped over. Yes. So Vandenberg has a cameo appearance. Because, oh, sorry, yes. The question is, um, does Arthur Bandenberg figure largely in my story? Because he was the most prominent isolationist, certainly from Western Michigan, and he was a prominent isolationist. In fact, when he changed his mind after World War II and came out in support of NATO and American engagement in the world, that was a really big deal. And so does he appear in my book? Yes, but very briefly. Um, only because, well, I've set it up as this debate between Roosevelt and Lindbergh. And I say enough about other people on both sides of that debate to let my readers know there are other people on the two sides of the debate. But I don't, by any means, kind of run dies, or certainly don't give equal treatment to everybody who is on the anti-interventionist side or on the interventionist side. Yeah. But, but he's a key figure. He's probably more important in the formation of policy after the war. Because when, so when Harry Truman is presenting to leaders of Congress what's going to become the Truman Doctrine and getting the United States involved in the affairs of the world. So he presents this to these leaders of Congress. And he's asking for money to support this policy. And Vandenberg and others say, well, 
you may, you may get your money, but to do it, you're going to have to scale, scare hell out of the American people. And this is what Truman proceeds to do. And when Vandenberg, the arch-isolationist, comes around in support of American engagement in Europe, then that makes it a bipartisan policy. And bipartisan policy is the ones that have the greatest lasting power. Other questions? Yes? Okay, so the position of the interventionists. Question. Oh, sorry, yes. So the question is, can I summarize the arguments, uh, the strongest arguments for intervention and for non-intervention in the 1930s and 40s? And then do the same today? Yeah, okay. So the case that Franklin Roosevelt made was that in the modern world, America can no longer isolate itself that what happens in Europe will affect the United States. The George Washington's advice was sound in 1796 when the Farewell Address was published. But this is not that world. And if the United States does not respond to aggression in Europe, the aggression will come to the United States. Okay, so this was the argument he made. And he bolstered it with claims that OK, airplanes can fly from Europe to the Americas and drop bombs. He was exaggerating things. He bolstered it with what turns out to have been a forged map showing that the German government, the Nazis, had already divided up in their minds the Nazi-ruled zones of the Western Hemisphere. And he presents this map in a, a speech that he gives, and it turns out that it was manufactured by the British government as part of their propaganda. So, but, but, but this is the argument that he makes. But basically, the argument that he made was, it was essentially the argument that Woodrow Wilson had made, and that is that aggression against democracy anywhere threatens democracy everywhere. And especially by 1941, American leaders were regretting that they had not encouraged the European leaders to stand up to Hitler at Munich. There was a conference in Munich in 1938, and it had to do with Hitler's demands, a part of Czechoslovakia. And the after-the-fact thinking was that that was the time when the democracy should have and could have stood up to Hitler. And if they had done so, it would have called Hitler's bluff, and probably the German people themselves would have overthrown him because he was asking too much. So that's the argument of the interventionist side. The argument of the anti-interventionist side is that, first of all, Europe is a continent that has always been at war. And if we go into Europe now, we will continue to be in their wars. They will have learned that they could get themselves in trouble. And they cry out to America, come rescue us. And America did the first time around. And if they get themselves, well, they did get themselves in trouble the second time around. And they cry out to America, come rescue us. And if America does the second time around, well, then they figured, we've got the Americans on a string. And so we won't bother to defend ourselves. America will defend us. So that's the argument. And I should point out, that Lindbergh and the other so-called isolationists, they were by no means anti-war in principle. They were by no means opposed to building up America's defenses. Lindbergh had this idea, which is quite audacious, that the United States should declare a security perimeter around the Western Hemisphere. And the United States should establish by force, if necessary, air bases and naval bases up and down both coasts of North and South America. And whether the South American republics agree or not, the United States is going to put them in there. So that, so that a foreign enemy like Nazi Germany cannot get a foothold in the Western Hemisphere. And this is the way we will defend the Western Hemisphere. But the frontier of the United States is 200 miles off the American coast, not on the Rhine River in Germany. Okay. So those are the arguments back then. Now, the arguments today, 
The arguments today are similar, but they're different technologically. I'll add a little bit to the argument of the anti-interventions of the 1930s. But first, I'll have to say that Roosevelt, the interventionist, said air power changes things. Because now planes can fly and they can inflict great damage on the United States. And Lindbergh, the anti-interventionist, who was also America's leading authority on air power, he knew the air forces of all the world. Because just to remind you, he became famous for flying across the Atlantic solo. And so he had done things in a plane nobody else had done. On the strength of this, he was invited by every country to come look at their latest aircraft and offer suggestions as how they can be made better. And so he knew exactly what kind of planes the British had, and the French, and the Germans, and the Russians, and the Japanese, and everybody. And he said this idea that somehow air power changes military strategy and gives an advantage to the attacker of the United States. This is ludicrous. He said, in fact, just the opposite is the consequence. Because before airplanes, before air power, if the Germans wanted to invade the United States, assuming it somehow got into their heads, then they would put soldiers on ships, and the ships would sail up against to American shores, and that's when the United States would be able to begin firing at them, when they got within coastal gun range. He said, now with planes, we can hit them when they're still 300 miles off American shores. America is better defended in the age of air power. OK. Now, that prediction, or at least that assessment, did not even survive World War II, because by the end of World War II, planes could fly thousands of miles. Lindbergh and essentially nobody foresaw the atom bomb and how you could inflict this sudden and tremendous damage on a country. So that, that would change things. But the interventionist argument, well, I'll, call it, I'll call it the neo-Rooseveltian argument, today is that there are bad people, there are bad regimes in the world. And in fact, the Biden administration and people who think that way talk about this axis of authoritarianism. And they line up Russia, Iran, China, and North Korea. And these are the bad people. And they use the term Axis. They borrow it from World War II, when the original Axis was Germany, Japan, and Italy. Okay? And so they're drawing direct connections. They want people to get those connections. And so they make the argument that if Russia can defeat Ukraine, then that will somehow help Iran crush Israel one day, and will encourage China to invade Taiwan. Now, it's kind of a leap of logic that China's policy is going to depend on the outcome of the war in Ukraine, but this is the argument that is made. And therefore, so the Biden administration is taking the position that the government of China is watching. And if the United States does not follow through on its commitment to Ukraine, then Taiwan is at greater risk. And the North Koreans will get emboldened, and they might try to invade South Korea. And then Japan will be at risk. And America's alliance system around the world will fall to pieces. So that remains the argument for American engagement in places and conflicts far away. The anti-interventionist argument today is that there is no end to the number of places the United States could engage. And for America to mortgage its future on what Vladimir Putin decides to do tomorrow, what Kim Jong-un decides to do tomorrow. This is silly. You cannot control people who are beyond your control. And even if the United States could assist, for example, in Ukraine's efforts to hold off Russian advances, okay? suppose Ukraine wins this war. Well, Russia is still going to be a very large country with a very long border next to Ukraine. And the Russians will still consider that Ukraine ought to be part of the United States. And so unless, unless, well, and this is exactly what Lindbergh said, unless the United States is determined to defend Ukraine forever, then you just got to cut your losses. And Lindbergh would have said, and don't go there in the first place. This is exactly what it's going to lead to. And he would have said, for example, with the war in Afghanistan, 
Okay, it's understandable the United States invaded Afghanistan in the immediate aftermath of the attacks of 9-11. We had to clear out the Al-Qaeda training camps. But for the United States to be there for 20 years, and you know, nothing good comes of it, you, Afghanistan after 20 years is no better off than it was at the beginning, and billions and billions of American dollars and thousands of American lives have been expended on this. What Lindbergh is saying is once you start down this path, and I would say that this argument is still holds for the anti interventionism Once you start patting down this path, there's no end to it. And I'll add something. That in 1941, the United States was far and away the leading economic power in the world. This was even more true by 1945, when Germany and Japan had been flattened. So in 1945, and I'll say this, um, with only slight exaggeration perhaps, that from 1945, until the beginning of the 21st century, America lived in an age of what I will call free security. Free in the following sense, that never did American policymakers say, you know, uh, should we go into Vietnam or not? Should we go into the Persian Gulf in the early 1990s or not? They never said, well, we shouldn't because it's going to be too expensive. Americans got used to the idea of having guns and butter both. But America is by no means the leader in the world economy today that it was in 1945. America's economic throw weight, basically, America's industrial GDP in 1945 equaled the rest of the world's combined. So America could try to do all this stuff and conceivably do it. Oh, except I'll point out one thing, that the wars after World War II have not been uniform successes for the United States. Now, they come out of the same mindset, but Vietnam, I'm assuming, Korea, well, that was an unsatisfactory tie. Vietnam was a loss. The war in the Persian Gulf, okay, it was a little bitty war, and it momentarily ended in victory, but it led to the war against Iraq in 2003, and that was a mess. And the war in Afghanistan was a loss that took 20 years to realize it was a loss. So the anti-interventionists would say, this is what you're up to when you say America is number one, and America has to defend the rest of the world. Now, I mean, I could go on with other things on argu arguments on both sides, but the, the economic question is a bigger deal. Although, neither side yet is saying we can't afford to do this stuff. But Americans are increasingly have to make a choice between do we spend billions on foreign policy, and maybe fighting other people's wars? Or do we fund Social Security or Medicare? These weren't issues in 1945. Social Security was in its infancy. Medicare didn't exist. But Americans have come to expect more of our government domestically. And so it's taking resources that might have been used for foreign policy away. And Americans are going to be making that decision. And perhaps some of that influenced the vote on Tuesday. How are we doing on? Time, yes. One more question. One more question. Okay. Uh, yes. So the single biggest instrument that got us involved in the Second World War was the oil embargo against Japan. <laughs> what was the non-intervention intervention to help that inflate oil embargo? Okay, so this is a very interesting question. The assertion is that the oil embargo against Japan was the principal trigger that got the United States involved in World War II. And I'll agree with that up to a point. And the point is that when the United States placed an oil embargo against Japan, it pretty much guaranteed that Japan would strike out against the United States. I will say this, and I was, I was actually a bit surprised by the fact that the debate over American entry into what's going to become World War II had almost nothing to do with policy toward Japan. It was all focused, 98% focused on what was going on in Europe. And part of this was because, well, Europe has always been more visible to Americans. Many more Americans have ancestral roots in Europe than have ancestral roots in Japan. Japan is far away. The war in Japan was not well covered in the American press or on American radio. Uh, one of the features of my book is these are transcripts of the radio shows of Edward R. Murrow who was saying, OK, this is the Battle of Britain, and explained the bombings that were coming down. So Americans were really aware of the war in Europe. 
to a way, and to a degree that they weren't aware of the war against uh, the war in Japan. But then, as to the, the embargo itself and its effect on getting the United States into the war, yes, it was the trigger, but it was the trigger for getting the United States involved in a war against Japan. Franklin Roosevelt wanted a war against Germany. Now, part of my story is that Franklin Roosevelt wanted a war against Germany because he believed that that's the way the United States would assert its power in the world. And Germany was the big threat in Europe, and that's, that's where the fight's going to be. I, I should add, that's what he wanted, but he consistently denied that's what he wanted. He said each of these steps to send arms to the British, to send ships to the British, to send Lend-Lease aid to the British, the whole point, said Roosevelt, is we send American arms to the Europeans so we don't have to send American troops to Europe. Well, that's really, that's not what he intended. In fact, just before the 1940 election, just days before the election, he said, if you elect me, I will not send your sons to fight in a foreign war. Now, his son, James, his eldest, his adult son, James, later called his dad out on this. He said, Dad, uh, how could you say such a thing? You knew that we were going to go to war. You wanted us to go to war. And James writes about this in his memoir years later. And, and Roosevelt says, by James's account, he said, James, yeah, I knew we were going to go to war. But I couldn't tell the American people that. Because as soon as I said we're going to go to war, then my rivals, my, my political enemies, they would say he's going to take us to war. He wants to take us to war. He wants to take us to war. And he said, you can't give your political enemies that kind of ammunition. Now, because Roosevelt was going to let events fall in place one after the other. And this gets back to the question. Roosevelt was determined he would have had his war against Germany because the United States Navy was already engaged in skirmishes on the Atlantic. And there was one involving a ship called the Greer, which Roosevelt claims is an unprovoked attack by a German submarine on this American vessel. The American vessel was peacefully steaming along, and all of a sudden these, some, these torpedoes from this submarine come and hit them. And this wasn't actually how it happened at all. The Greer was providing guidance to British planes and British ships who were dive bombing and depth charging this German submarine. And the submarine actually couldn't tell that this was an American ship. The British ship was the one that was doing the firing, but as far as the Germans knew, that was this joint operation. And so it was, in fact, I was, I was mentioning just the other day, and, and somebody said, oh, oh, I get it. This is Roosevelt's version of the Gulf of Tonkin incident, where you, you make it up. Anyway, so Roosevelt was going to have a cause of war. There was going to be something that would trigger the war. In fact, when the Japanese attacked Pearl Harbor, it gave Roosevelt about three days of real hand-wringing because he had wanted a war against Germany. And what he got was a war against Japan. And he thought, oh my gosh, this makes things worse because Congress had been reluctant to declare war against Germany. But now, the United States had been attacked by Japan, and it had no choice. So Congress immediately, that is the next day, declared war against Japan. And Roosevelt's saying, well, OK, uh, can I talk Congress into, just out of the blue, declaring another war? You know, when we got one on our hands, another one? And so he didn't know what was going to happen. But after three days, after 72 hours, Hitler, kind of out of the blue, declares war on the United States. And historians have sort of puzzled, people at the time, puzzled, why did he do it? And the answer is, well, he understood Roosevelt well enough to know that Roosevelt would get his war sooner or later. And Hitler, I guess, wanted to strike the first blow, or at least make the first declaration. So by this time, there would have been a war. The, the precipitant was the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor, but that wasn't really the cause. The underlying cause was deeper. And it was Roosevelt's belief that the United States, that American interests required a war against Germany. Anyway, thank you very much. Thanks, man.
he said two kinds of courses. I would focus on more rhetoric courses, public presentations and speaking, and I would focus on history. And I think in Bill, we have a demonstration of both of those skills. The passion and the energy of the rhetoric is striking, of course, but the historical knowledge is stunning. You can ask Bill just about any question on any historical topic, and he's got a great perspective on it. He sort of epitomizes the ideal of a liberally educated person who can handle what is on the table. Well, that's what I like to think that we do here. You know, Brooke, with her great staff at the Presidential Museum, uh, I'll sing praises of, of our great staff also at the uh, Gerald R. Ford Presidential Foundation. Together we work to bring you these kinds of programs. We're very proud of it because we think in this temple of democracy, there are a lot of answers to today's questions. You look at those two people on the wall, and they have a lot of answers to what we face today. That's what Bill's whole talk was about in his magisterial way. What he does day in and day out at the University of Texas, what he does in some 50 public presentations a year, he presents the context of the challenges we have today and what we have to do to meet them. Now, this is where my pitch comes in. How many of you in here are not a friend of Ford, our official membership program? Raise your hand. Don't be shy. Get a little bit higher. Oh, okay, sir. We got, uh, I count about five or six of you. Okay, outside these doors is an envelope and a little cheat sheet that tells you the different levels. I don't care what level you come in. Join Friends of Ford. Bring your neighbors. We need this place. We need Brooks exhibits more than ever. Right? We're going to do that? Now, there's something else out in that lobby that I want you to think about, and that is this book. Bill's come here to sign what you're going to be purchasing as great holiday gifts for this, it's coming right up. Just think you could get most of your holiday gifts taken care of in one night by purchasing this thing and have them personally signed to your loved one or to yourself. Yeah, give yourself a holiday gift, why not? The last thing that I would like to do is, uh, we just inaugurated the last time uh, we met, uh, you'll recall it was with uh, uh, Hank Meyer and uh, we had Hank Meyer and Richard Norton Smith with us. And by the way, Richard Norton Smith, I wanna add this, just one thing. Richard Norton Smith, our predecessor to Brooke and me, famously said, and I can't tell you how many times I repeat it, when it comes to history, there is no excuse for a boring history lecture, paper, article, or book. Right? Can we agree with that? No excuse for boring. And so in Bill, we guarantee you, as we say in Texas, you'll never get bored listening to Bill. But because you've been such a good audience, you've come here and you've been supportive, we've inaugurated sort of a new tradition here at the Ford. We give out a Gerald Ford gift to our friends of Ford. Somebody is going to be lucky enough to win what's in this bag. I'm not going to tell you what it is, but, but Bill got what's in here too. So I ask you to determine the winner. How many books do you think Bill Brands has published? Shout it out. 50, 11. Who said 30? Okay, higher, lower than 30? 43. Who said 37? Okay, you won. Very good. Going all the way back, Bill's been publishing books since 1988, going all the way back to his doctoral dissertation and it was on Eisenhower, and that, he turned that dissertation into a book. And so you had a good, how did you know that? All right, well, that's a good answer. Okay, very good. Okay, so ma'am. Well, this is our last program for what has been a great fall. And it's been a great fall because we have 
incredible material, the source documents, the material, and the lives of character of President and Mrs. Ford, because we're about virtue at the helm, character at the helm here. And it's also been great because of you coming to all of these programs we've had since August 9th when President Ford came to the White House 50 years ago. We have a great lineup this coming winter and spring, and uh, we look forward to seeing you there. Have a good evening. Thank you so much.